mapping out what, what you know already uh, helps you to have an overview and to understand already a little bit where you want to go deeper, when you, where you want um, uh, to deepen the knowledge and what you could connect and how to tell the story. So here is what we are going to talk about today. And um, yeah, we will start with the challenge. Well, sustainability transformation. Uh, why, why do we have this necessity to transform society towards more sustainability? And actually, what system are we talking about? What is at stake? So these are the first questions I want to look at. Um, 10 years. So all the big global environmental reports, they conclude that actually our room for maneuver is slowly shrinking. That means uh, they say that we have approximately 10 years left to take the um, adequate uh, and consequent governmental actions, but also societal action to keep the earth in a stable condition that allows uh, humans and other living, other living beings to thrive. And when I speak of global reports, I mean, for example, the IPCC report on climate, you surely are aware of that one, but also there is a big one um, about biodiversity of the CBD, the Convention on Global on Biological Diver Diversity. And there is also uh, another big one, another big report. It's the one on resources uh, by the Intergovernmental Resource Panel. And for all these reports, countless um, scientists, they brought in all their knowledge they have to date, and they created an overview for these, for these fields. And all of them concluded, came to the same conclusion. Like they said, action is really urgent. Well, and given um, the fact that we have all that knowledge already, um, yeah, I think what we should focus on is really uh, solutions. Like we need innovative approaches on all kinds of levels throughout society and from science, from the policy area, um, by all kinds of actors to, to be able to reduce the environmental impact uh, on the environment. Well, so the question is how how did we end up in this situation? <laughs> and here I want to show you this graph. I think it's quite an important thing because it is, it stands for a mindset that I think is, is having a very strong imprint on, on every one of us. Since the 1950s, we observed this steeply rising curve uh, emerging in all kinds of data sets. It can be data describing social, economic, environmental parameters. Wherever you look, you see that kind of graph. It's termed the so-called Great Acceleration, and it stands for a world of growing um, material desires, I would say, uh, triggered also or made possible through mass production. And well, since the 1950s, human influence on Earth has increased almost exponentially. And now humanity has become a force that even overrides natural processes. We entered a decade or we entered a time, um, a geological age, uh, that scientists termed the Anthropocene. Well, so actually, oh, I'm sorry, I have to. Yep. So, um, well, the next question is, what can be done that this Anthropocene era remains favorable for humans and also for other living beings? What has to happen? And there many people would say, okay, societal transformation is the answer. So we, we come up with this buzzword. But what does that really mean? What do we actually have to achieve? And in which direction should this transition go? And well, these are really tough and difficult questions. So I, I thought right now I serve you a, a cookie to sweeten up those challenges a little bit. And um, well, but this is not a random cookie. It's a Willi Sauerringli. 
maybe you know that one. It's a typical Swiss one, traditionally made in central Switzerland, I guess. It's quite a hard one. So if you bite on it, uh, you uh, risk uh, to damage your teeth. But once you dip the cookie into coffee or tea, it unfolds a very nice and remarkable sweetness, no? So actually this cookie for me, it, it stands for or it represents, yeah, I don't believe you have that one. <laughs> very nice. Um, well, this cookie, it stands um, uh, for what we are trying to to achieve this ring you see it equals with the so-called safe and just space for humanity um, this ring is represents the promise uh, of a better life for humans but also for other living beings but it needs an effort it is hard to get there you need appropriate strategies like for example dipping the cookie into the tea and well, now we switch to the official <laughs> um, image of this model I am talking about. Um, this model here sums up quite much what is at stake from the environmental, but also from the social perspective. It's, uh, it sums up what is um, the Anthropocene challenge, what, what it is about. Um, it shows what the aim of uh, the sustain, this, this desired sustainability transition would be. The model was created by Johan Rockström. He is a earth scientist and uh, by Kate Roberts, who is an economist. And they brought together again, all their knowledge, uh, all the relevant knowledge um, up to date uh, into that holistic view of what the Anthropocene challenges are about. And now, if you look at it a bit closer, you see the green ring. So you see our really sour ringly again. And um, well, obviously here we go for the more international idea. So this model is also called the donut model. And in green, you see the safe and just space for humanity. And I would add also for other living beings here. And it is actually um, this area we are heading to when we speak of societal transformations. That's where we want to go. And well, you see the outer ring of this, um, of this circle or the outer circle of this ring, um, it equals uh, the so-called planetary boundaries. So it is uh, the ecological ceiling representing the carrying capacity of the planet. And what you can also see in this image is that in some areas um, of Earth systems there that are key to keep the planet in a stable state, we already transgressed this boundary. So, for example, when it comes to biodiversity loss or um, climate change or also some key uh, nutrient circles like the nitrogen circle, they show an overshoot. So here we have even to take regenerative actions to get back into that green space we are heading for. The inner circle instead uh, uh, represents a, um, a solid social foundation. And um, usually uh, you can refer here to the human rights. So there are still countries and places where human rights not are fully uh, ensured for everyone. So also here, countries need to move um, forward into that green space. Um, yeah, but now let's have a look a bit more closely at the environmental data. So at the outer ring of this uh, planetary boundary uh, of this donut model, the planetary boundaries and the Federal Office for the Environment, they published a study analyzing how the environmental impact is caused. And this study looked really also at, um, at the whole um, thing from a, from a holistic point of view. And uh, it referred to the whole life, life cycle of, of, consum of consumer goods, all the way from production, consumption, use, and then until things go to waste. And this study found that 12% of the environmental impact is caused by the mobility system. So by the way we move around. So within this system, our choice of vehicles, of course, is very important, especially how we power them. 
um, fossil fuels. They are a huge source of CO2 and contribute significantly to uh, climate change. But there are also other aspects of that system that enter into um, in, uh, that enter into the whole picture. Like, for example, um, where we live and where we work and where we go shopping and how the distances between those places are, how much we are asked to move around and so on. All of that matters. Um, well, then um, the second uh, there is another big system, the housing system. So another 24% of the environmental impact in Switzerland uh, is caused uh, through housing, through built up areas. Here, again, the materials we use to construct our buildings, they are key. So if you choose a natural material like wood, for example, you reduce your environmental impact considerably. Um, well, concrete instead is a very CO2 intensive material. But also it matters how we heat our houses, uh, how much energy we use also for our domestic devices, but also how much space we use for our houses is relevant. The bigger the houses get, the more soil we use. And once the soil is sealed with concrete, um, well, it gets lost for other life forms for, for biodiversity, basically. Um, with 28%, uh, the food system is really the one who is the, the winner, so to say. So it's the, that one that causes the most environmental impact. Um, cultivation of food is important. How we produce is important. Um, what kind of agricultural system we have. So it's a difference um, whether uh, you do biological or traditional farming, for example. But then also our diets matter, like the choice of, um, of food we have on our plates is really highly relevant, especially if when it comes to important uh, to imported um, uh, foods um, or in our diet, for example, even like avocados, even shipped uh, um, by plane, for example. Uh, well, so also the cultural uh, approaches and mindsets about food and health and so on, they matter in, within that system. Um, and then last but not least, uh, what we waste is very important. Like in Switzerland, every year 2.8 million tons of food are lost, as study says, by Beretta and Helweg from 2019. And that actually means um, a, a, an incredible amount, like 330 kilogram per person per year. So that's quite something. And if we would, uh, for example, only cut these losses down to half, the environmental impact of the food system could be re reduced between 10 and 15% within the next 20 years. So, um, well, and also on a, on a global scale, food losses, they account for around 6% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So, and also food is our most dominant and most, and, um, most domin dominant link and most direct interface uh, with other living beings on this planet, be it plants or animals. We have to keep that in mind. Well, the story has not um, fully ended with these three systems accounting for the big chunk of environmental impact, but there is a twist in this story, like another number I want really to, uh, to keep you in mind. 75% of our environmental impact actually happens abroad, not within Switzerland. So. 75% um, of the impact um, that we create uh, due to what we consume is happening elsewhere, not in Switzerland. Um, through the important goods, we e export a lot of environmental pollution towards, towards those countries where our products come from. So that's quite a thing. And, um, yeah, for example, just to give you an illustration of how that works, um, uh, for example, look at this tomato. This tomato is important from, um, from Spain, 
and it is uh, it was growing in a quite dry and arid uh, area in Spain and it needed quite some water to grow right so by importing uh, this tomato to Switzerland we also import all the water from Spain which is will be missing in Spain so it um, afterwards and who would have thought that actually a country like Switzerland so rich in water resources um, imports so much water in um, here so that's quite uh, an amazing thing where system thinking really can help you reveal those hidden connections that's why we have to think about environmental impacts in a, in a systemic way and combine different geographical scales, but also um, different scales in time, for example, uh, into one into one image to under to really understand uh, the the causes and the underlying connections. Well, oops. Um, next is uh, how can we uh, actually um approach all this complexity how can we make that happen <laughs> yeah it's it's really how to do something totally impossible well and here i would like um to tell you um a, a little story and um i think it all starts with our mind i think because um, i i really think that how we imagine the world the world becomes and our assumptions values and beliefs they are a very strong uh, determinant of those systems for example causing so much environmental impact and uh, one thing that i think is so important and key is the ability to imagine a different world a different way of doing things and I would like to share with you an artwork um, that shows that you can do really impossible things. And well, that's, um, I would like to, to read uh, to you a small, a little a part from, from the book I made. Uh, <laughs> uh, if we, Amina, she shared it, the link. And the book is actually a collection of hopeful ideas stemming from art and science that might support us to create that safe and just space I was just talking about. There's also a chapter about system thinking uh, referring to that artwork I'm going to show you. So in 1981, Sardinian artist Maria Lai, she com was commissioned by the municipality of a small town in, in Sardinia to create a war memorial, but she wanted to do something for the living. So for one day, uh, the inhabitants of the village tied themselves and their houses to the mountain overlooking the village. A blue ribbon was passed um, from one house to the other, from uh, creating notes between families in the village, representing their relation to each other and to the environment. The complex social fabric, a system of manifold relations, became visible, with the mountain acting as, as the anchor. So Maria Lai's work, um, uh, Maria Lai's understanding of Ulasai and its inhabitants is a systemic understanding. She connects everything into a web of life. She teaches us system thinking through showing that every element has importance for the village as a whole. A single element is defined through its relation, giving it a place embedded in its environment, and every part is relevant for the functioning of the whole. So here are two more images. And it shows that you can do really something truly extraordinary. Yeah, an idea is so crazy to connect a whole village uh, to a mountain. And she did it, as you can see here uh, within, in these images. So now enough about mindsets and, <laughs> and um, yeah, theoretical thoughts. Um, I would like to invite you now to open the Miro link uh, Guillermo uh, um, shared with you in the chat. And um, I can also uh, share my screen. 
Yeah, I think that they did not get it, so I will copy it again. Um, copy link in here. Oh, here. There you go. So everyone yeah. should have access right now. Yeah, so I also shared my um, screen right now. Um, maybe, so maybe you can, we can just, uh, I can explain you what we are going to do here. Um, I want to uh, make a small demonstration of how we analyze the food system. So we take the food system as an example. And um, first I would like to do with you um, a small uh, causal loop diagram, of course, very basic, but just to get, give you an, an idea about how we do this or how we analyze this in, in, within the field of environmental reporting, um, for example. Then I will show you also the model of transformation we were using, and I will uh, show you how we um, then processed all this information into uh, results we can also discuss or we can use to inform uh, policymakers. So let's focus maybe first um, on the um, on the green um, on the green square and. Yeah, in the middle of, of the upper part, you see now the cookie again. So that's where we want to go, the sustainable food system. And I want uh, to give you now around five minutes, uh, just very short, and you just take uh, sticky notes. Some are already there and you write whatever comes to your mind about the food system. And the, the question we are asking ourselves is always, what leads directly to more of XYZ, to more sustainable food in our case. Um, yeah, so please feel free, just start um, um, uh, with the work. Maybe one more thing I could uh, say or I could share is um, maybe you are aware of this famous iceberg model. Like, so when you think about the food system, um, try to, to go a little bit deeper and to ask, uh, well, what are what is visible on the surface, but also what are the trends you can you can think of? What kind of patterns? What the kind of behavioral aspects might matter within the food system? What kind of how am I thinking about the food system? So um, yeah, just uh, to widen or uh, a little bit the horizon. So also. Um, would try to link also some of these sticky notes between each other. Um, yeah, so for example, I made one uh, more one example with more biological agriculture leads directly to more sustainable food. But then I can ask myself also, and what leads to uh, more biological agriculture? So. You can step by step, you go deeper and you add more and more layers of knowledge. So I would say, um, yeah, we, we take some minutes um, to work on this model. We can see a lot of activity right now on the board. <laughs> and if you have, uh, if you have uh, questions, I, I think it's not possible to ask them directly, right? Hear me now, how does it? Uh, they can write it in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, so you yeah. let me know if something pops up. I yeah. Be a little. Great. Yeah, I also tried already to make a little bit of a pre-grouping, like on um, on the side with the uh, with the wheat. You see that's more the production side. The, the image of the plate uh, is more like the the consumer, the demand side of of the system. 
but uh, yeah, you will see it's also a lot of interlinkages between the two. So it's, it's just to create some sort of an overview. I'm still in presentation mode. We also see some arrows appearing. <laughs> yes, so try also to link, maybe create links now between the nodes already present. I go back to presentation mode, otherwise I make a mess, I see. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I can start already while you are uh, right, still writing. I can um, share some observations now, I see. Um, I really, what I can see already now is that you have a lot, that there are almost, um, let's say the broad aspects of a system, they are already covered i see some like for example farm to fork that's the also the european um food um, food uh, aim or food uh, framework so um there's something on the policy side but also uh, a very local food and um so it's on the on the production side and that links the production and the consumption side um do I see fair prices refers to the aspects of markets? And there's also a very interesting one um, showing the, the link between um, health and food, improved healthcare impact. I think that's very interesting. Yeah, so I think we can um, maybe one more minute and then we, we stop it. So maybe now uh, you could also try to link those, uh, those different sticky notes. Maybe we take some, some two, three more minutes for that. And I think we should focus now just on the on the leads more uh, leads to more links. Very nice, thank you. So, um, well, what I the first uh, observation I want uh, to have now or to say is, you see, the amount of information we gathered in roughly five minutes, maybe, <laughs> and without uh, having had a, a previous conversation about uh, what the food system might be and so on, you just started out of, of the blue with your knowledge. And the amount of information we can gather in such a short time in a collaborative exercise is really amazing. So that is my first observation. Also, I, I see that some, um, some of the nodes, they go really into detail and um, others are more general. 
that also helps to group the information later on. So the next step we would do here is now uh, we would go uh, together, like we would open all the microphones and we, will, and we would ask um, each other, what did you mean exactly by um, fair, fair prices, for example? How do you interpret improved healthcare? How exactly does that, to lead, does that lead to more sustainable food? Are there maybe more intermediate factors we should think of and we should add? And we would have that kind of discussions. We would group things. And um, uh, of course, we are not having enough time to do that here now. But um, um, I want to show you how such a system um, could look in a, like I just maybe we can switch on the shared screen again. I'm not sure who all is in the still in the uh, Miro board or if you scroll down, you see a, a, a print screen I made from a model. Um, we used to do this at, at FOWEN and also in the European context, we use a tool that is called iModeler. I put the link next to it, next to the print screen, um, this uh, no Ynet link. And actually this is a free tool you can use um, and also the nice thing about iModeler is that there are a lot of uh, questions already modeled and they are accessible on the, um, on, on the internet and you can use that, those ones also to have a first idea or overview before creating your own models. And you will see that this model is, is quite complex because we add also the negative uh, or inverse relations. So what leads to less of, we can add feedback loops and you will suddenly see that uh, different factors are linked together from from different sides so you um, can really uh, analyze this system afterwards uh, in a lot of ways like this iModeler tools allows you also to add data for example in the model like we could quantify the relations and add and also it allows you to have different timestamps of the model so in all these tools uh, we can use to map out the system. It goes from very basic, like we, we did now collaboratively just with these sticky notes in a very simple and quick way. And it can go to really uh, in-depth quanti qu um, quantified modeling. Um, but the principle behind it is always the same. What leads to more, what leads to less? So I think that gives you a good idea of what we did. Now, um, I let's go. Let's go one step ahead. I um, what we did uh, to analyze uh, the food system, the mobility, and the housing system. Uh, the next step was we were asking ourselves, well, but how can um, sustainability transition happen? How does a transition in change? Uh, in, in society happen? What, how do societies change? And also here we refer to a model and it's just one model uh, among many, right? So um, this is a model for social technical change called the multi-level perspective. It's theorized by, by Gels. I also added the, um, the link to all these writings and all the, the model and the text about it in, in the references. And this model is uh, quite a simple one. It says actually that um, society or, or a social technical system like the food system changes for two reasons. On the one hand, it can be uh, due to trends in the landscape, changes in the landscape. So that's what you see uh, here in gray. And that's for example, dig digital tools, precision farming or all kinds of, of, of things like this climate change impacts. They have, of course, a strong pressure. They can um, uh, give a strong pressure onto the food system because of water scarcity, for example, and the uh, different temperature regimes and things like that. And then change can also happen, um, be triggered from innovations that are coming from the niche, like from small areas, protected areas, where new ideas and innovations are are um, developed and if everything goes right so these innovations they can take um, 
the place of something pre-existing within the, the regime. And the regime itself, it, it is consisted of markets, finances, technologies, products, services, behaviors, lifestyles, values, and policies, institutions, but also research and education or infrastructures, they play a role. So this framework helps you to take now all the sticky notes we have, we could put them and ask ourselves, okay, um, in terms of uh, less waste, what kind of trends do we have? Where is waste happening within the regime? Or are there innovations that can show us uh, um, a different way of of dealing with our wastes, for example, or reusing those wastes. So we could ask ourselves all those questions within uh, a model of change. Um, yeah, below you see the, the this model again, as um, I shared with you uh, a quite well written report about sustainability transition. It's done by the European Environment Agency. That's also where we did a lot of this system analysis and gives you an overview also over other possible models to map out change or societal transitions. Um, yeah, so what I want to add here is also, um, well, take the freedom to, to also uh, combine different models of thought and get creative uh, with, those, with those thoughts in the end. Uh, it's it's a model, it's a way of describing the world, and we are always free to adapt that and to, to go one step beyond and to combine different thoughts. So I think that's, that's something um, valid to do. Well, now, up to now, I showed you the different steps that um, add complexity, right? So we added layers and layers of knowledge. We added knowledge about trends, innovations, what is out there, we try to understand the system itself. Um, but then, uh, well, <laughs> there is the moment where you have to simplify all the knowledge you gathered again. And um, uh, well, at, at, um, yeah, you have to kind of group and make create a product that is very simple to be able to carry out the necessary discussions you want to, you want to lead. And, um, in our case, we came up with like just five very simple levers. So we asked ourselves, what are the most important um, levers within that system, within the food system? And um, what, how could we um, move those levers? So um, yeah, we came up with these five you see in the green, in the green box. And what, what we also did is we went out to look at um, to search for real life examples that help us to understand how we can move those levers, how can we activate those levers. And there's a collection, I put two websites there, where you can see a lot of um, good examples, good practice examples that illustrate uh, the levers uh, here we, we came up with. So it's a, in the end, after this process, you come up with very, something very simple, and you need that to be able to um, discuss afterwards also, for example, with policymakers. And you have to link that also to, to real existing um, examples to illustrate what you mean. Well, so now I would um, like to go back to the presentation. In just a second. So, well, so now I showed you already <laughs> quite some of that um, universe. And um, well, what I want to do now is just share a few thoughts to finish, a few reflections and experiences I had. And I want to start uh, with, a, with a mushroom. <laughs> Actually, usually when we when we look at something very quickly, we see only what it is ab above the ground. Like we see the the mushroom, the kind of the fruit uh, above the ground. But a mushroom is about much more. It's it in it in um, 
there's also this whole world of the mycelium that belongs to the mushroom and we don't see it because it is in the soil. So what I want to say here is it is worth to literally dig deep. <laughs> so system thinking helps us to reveal what's beyond and around the mushroom. And we don't focus on the mushroom itself, but we just uh, we also focus on how um, the mushroom relates to its environment and um, yeah, to the soil, to the forest as such. Uh, yeah, remember the iceberg. So um, that is um, why, uh, yeah. And I also think that system thinking needs time and care <laughs> and, and a will to go uh, deeper and go beyond the obvious kind of. And uh, speaking of nature, like, yeah, um, also speaking about the food system, um, yeah, we talk about we talk about nature, and I want to share with you, um, well, a gentle reminder about how complex and sophisticated actually nature is. Uh, here, this is the um, a very nice website, a so-called tree of life, uh, where you can serve and move yourself to to all how life came upon on, on Earth. And if you type fungi, for example, you it it. It really is it's mind blowing where the journey takes you. So, well, we are dealing with nature, highly sophisticated and complex. Well, then I think sometimes, yeah, I'm contradicting myself a little bit, but uh, it's not so important to understand the system in all its details. Because if we wait to understand everything to detail, we have 10 years left, how, how might we uh, be active and become active um, then? Yeah. Well, sometimes I think, um, yeah, things simply are contradictory. They are fuzzy and they change quickly. And well, to make a next step, often it's enough to kind of have an idea of the pattern, uh, how things work together. And then we can try out. And this is my next message. We have to experiment. We cannot know everything. So I imagine it a little bit like this famous Rubik cube. You twist and turn and uh, and try to align those colors and well experimentation leads to experience and eventually we understand better what actions they may may nurture our system and give the system more resilience and also we understand better what uh, does not work and we detect when something goes wrong so it's important to to try out especially when Speaking of sustainability changes, you have to experiment. Um, then I want to share with you uh, a chart about all kinds of biases we have. Well, when we talk, uh, when we describe a system, we always do that from a specific per, uh, perspective, and it's our own. And this is the chart of all kinds of human uh, biases, cognitive biases humans can have. But just imagine about how many biases we probably have um, towards non compared to non living uh, um, to other living beings like plants and animals. So this is the human biases. Uh, well, there might be much more. It's important to think of where where we are and be aware of these biases. And how can we overcome that? Well, um, here I want to show uh, share with you a work I really like. Um, it is an installation by the um, um, by some designers uh, by the Superflux Studio. They created an interspecies or multi-species uh, dinner table. Uh, they imagined how it would be to invite other species around the table. So for me, this this work shows that to over to solve a problem, you need. Um, to invite as many possible other mindsets to the table as you can, um, because they might have a lot of different views and um, bring in a lot of different knowledge. So this is the placemat for the boss, for example. Um, yeah, and now I'm coming to the end. So in the end, I think uh, it is all about relations. Relations are at the center of it all. It's about how we relate to each other, to other types of knowledge, uh, uh, other expertises, but also to how we relate to nature, other living beings, 
and well that is really what is at the heart of of those um, sustainability challenges we are we are facing and we should really and that's also where system thinking starts it's all about relations and yeah so i would like to encourage you to really take that perspective and and care for these relations thank you very much thank you karin and now we can start um questions from the students uh, so please go ahead and write them in the chat i know that some of you uh, were already thinking and planning some questions so um, start writing Karin, if you want, we can stop uh, sharing screen. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So we go um, bigger. And I don't see questions, but in, in the meanwhile, while we receive, um, we have Luisa writing in the chat. Thank you, Luisa. Um, while we have students asking questions, I will ask you, how do you think we can teach and, or we can learn to modify the way we relate to other people, uh, with ourselves, uh, with our environment, with part of the system? Because that's not an, an easy thing to change. Yes, and the only thing you can do is you can just do it and try it out. I mean. I, I think that, for example, I try like in my in my practice, whenever I have the chance to um, deal with a problem in, or I have a, a space, then to experiment, I try to invite to invite other people like other experiences, other mindsets. Um, well, for example, um, uh, conferences are is such a, a space mm -hmm. where I always try to bring in like people who are really doing change in the world. Like I, I invite uh, projects that are really hands on out there changing the food system or mm -hmm. creating something very nice out of food waste. So and I try to bring that into the policy discussion in the policy level so that people really meet each other and they get to know each other and to get to know their their respective worlds. So I think that's that's yeah sees every opportunity to bring in other mindsets for example that's something so we could say that through conversations uh, through meeting people through conversing with them through interacting with them we can start changing relationships yes but it, there is not only the conversation but also the working on something very concrete Okay. That can also help a lot. Like, I mean, not only, ah, it's nice, you know, otherwise you end up also a little bit like what happens maybe with Greta Thunberg in the in a big setting like the COP26, right? Mm -hmm. She's there and, well, she was there. What We invited their voices, but, well, <laughs> it, it stops there. But also if you have the possibility, like in to bring in for real other people and to work with them over also over a longer time um, yeah I think that's very helpful good thank you and we have a question by Jorge Frascara that says how can you deal with promoting change where people ask frequently what is there for me well yeah that is a very difficult question actually I don't have the answer Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of research going on about these behavioral um, aspects of how people change. I think one path to that is that we have a lot of positive narratives, positive ideas about the future. Mm -hmm. um, that is one path. Uh, and also, um, you know, when you speak to people who actually changed something, they always are quite satisfied with their uh, situation like they feel a kind of a happiness and um, this can be very um, uh, contagious to say mm -hmm. so like and and to to hear these experiences and real life stories about yeah from from people who who start their own mm -hmm. small business reusing waste for example mm -hmm. 
um, that can be very inspirational and help others to also step forward. Yeah, but um, yeah, of course, uh, this mindset I talked about with this graph that is rising so like this imperative of growth of I want more, uh, all of this, it, it's very deep inside us now. And um, yeah, it, it also will maybe take time to adjust and to change this again. Yeah. We have a question in the Q&A and it says, is art and cultural making an impact towards sustainability? What are your views? Yes, uh, of course, I think art can uh, has a, a, a big impact mm -hmm. and uh, not only in terms of that you create a sculpture of plastics uh, harvested in the ocean, but also much more from a, from a processal uh, point of view. Because I observe that artists, um, when they do their, their proper thing, what they want to do, what they feel they have to do, um, yeah, they, they are sometimes like scientists. They do a research, they dig really deep, but they derive a total different type of knowledge, which is super helpful and super inspiring for, for also for, for scientists. And I also see that um, slowly, I, I have the feeling that slowly uh, these boundaries between um, science and art, they start also to mix, especially around the topic of climate change, for example. Um, well, and especially when you think of relational arts, you know, where, where people do not, or artists do not produce um, artwork uh, as sculptures or a painting, but they create and stage relations. Mm -hmm. So that is something very powerful and it can be really uh, mind blowing and, and also contribute to, to change. I think, yes, art has a very strong, important uh, thing to say. And we know there were uh, some um, system thinkers like Gregory Bateson, uh, Edgar Moran, that thought and think Edgar Moran is, is alive, that um, it's a mistake to separate disciplines the way we are separating them. So psychology from sociology, from the arts, um, that that's not helping us, particularly in addressing the type of problems um, you are describing. However, we have uh, schools separated like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's not helpful to separate these things. On the other hand, sometimes the, the issues at stake, they are so overwhelming. You mm -hmm. have to, to break it down somehow. And it's also good to have kind of a, a knowledge and an expertise and a practice that is truly your own and from where to start. So I, I think I'm a geographer and I think that's very relevant to be a, a you know, to be, to be something, right? But then I can always invite others. It's not, it, this is not to say that you have to do everything, that you have to be a polymath yourself. Mm -hmm. it, it's not possible. The world is so complex, but I think, and that's, uh, that's a task for designers, especially, uh, because you are so trained to look at all kinds of different um, ideas and, and, and points of view and also the design thinking processes, they are done to invite all these kind of different views, to invite them uh, onto the, the dinner table, right? And um, yeah, I, I think it's more that, that practice of inviting others that we should cultivate, it's not uh, it's not that you have to know everything by yourself. So you can be an expert, but um, if you are a good host, if you create a nice dinner table, so everyone will come and join you for, for, the, for the feast, right? For the party. And um, I think that's, that's what I am or what I try to, yeah, to live and, and to aim at more or less. Good. Thank you. You mentioned experimentation. And I think that, uh, yes, that's a key area where um, it's very important to explore futures in a, an interdisciplinary way, because different disciplines have different ways of um, experimenting. So, and perhaps that's uh, where design can also contribute. I see a question by Andreas. 
And that's a long question. She said, <laughs> do you think that we can change through uh, spreading awareness? Education is important, but I believe that it is crucial to show the people how to really engage. There must be some kind of experience that all Swiss scholars should make. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, visiting a glacier or showing the problem in direct and engage on the spot. What do you think? Yes, I, I completely agree. I, I think that um, the best thing of teaching something to someone is if they do it by themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Words, well, that's one thing, but if you go hands on, it, it helps. So you could simply, I think one experience everyone should do is walking through the neighborhood and collect waste, for example. <laughs> um, well, just to give an idea of what, what, what people throw away. And you will understand that there's all kinds of materials that could be recycled, reused or repurposed in some way. Um, well, or work uh, at the farm. Mm -hmm. Go for one day and help a farmer, a, a biological farmer who needs to, I don't know, pick, pluck the weed um, mm -hmm. by hand or with basic tools um, because they cannot use uh, pesticides or things like that. It, yeah, I, I think that that's the best way actually to raise awareness. And I think also that uh, the education system in Switzerland is also having a big part of that um, in, in, in the environmental education of the kids have. So uh, yeah, I think that kind of a field trip <laughs> is, 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 is quite nice, yeah. Good. So uh, if there are no more questions, we can close here and hopefully through um, exploration, through field trips, um, through relations, uh, our students and also our community will start becoming more aware of our surrounding, where we can intervene, but also what is happening. Having in mind, as you said, that we cannot have the whole system uh, in mind. <laughs> yes. Yeah, maybe thank you very much um, for all the questions and um, for those who like to go on uh, with the conversation conversation i can also put my email address on the mirror board so feel free anytime okay. to write to me to contact me also if you need data or yeah reports or whatever um yeah i would invite you i'm i'm, I'm here i like really like this kind of exchanges and feel free to contact me so yeah. great it will be great <laughs> if they can contact you you share the your sure. email in the mirror that would be fantastic Thank you very much, Karin, for sharing your experience, your knowledge uh, with us, your work. I think it has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you for having been here. Thanks Thank you. <laughs> bye, Karin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>